This lecture is the lecture on stress and its effects on our health and our behavior. Uh, this lecture is given on Friday, January 29th. We'll start by talking about the causes of stress. When we talk about stress itself, there are those things that cause us to experience stress. These are known as stressors. Stressors are those events, those moments, those feelings, those thoughts that make us feel stress. And then how we respond to those stressors is what we would call our stress reaction. Now, some stress can actually be beneficial and can help us grow as individuals. Uh, you stress is considered to be good stress. It's the stress that you get when you're actively preparing for a test, uh, the stress that you get when you're, uh, you know, working hard at a, at a sports event um, or at some sort of competition. Um, and it's how we grow as individuals. If we view that stress as that, if we view that stress as uh, something as positive, as something that's going to help us grow, um, then it will um, help us develop further as an individual. However, loss of stress um, are emotionally damaging, are, is a struggle uh, to our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and this we would call distress. So when we are feeling stressed out, you could say that we're in a state of distress. Ultimately, a lot of times it's conflict situations that cause us to experience stress. There are four different types of conflict situations. The first is an approach-approach conflict situation. And that's a situation in which both potential outcomes are positive. So we want to do both, but we can't. Like, do we want to go to the movies with our friends or out to dinner with our family? Avoidance-avoidance are when both scenarios are uh, are, are when both scenarios are something that we would kind of consider to be negative or we would perceive it as negative. Like, do I want to do my homework or clean my house? An approach avoidance stress uh, conflict situation um, is a situation where we don't know the potential outcome uh, of it, of our choices. Um, so, uh, you know, if I uh, go to school uh, late, um, Will I, uh, you know, feel more relaxed or will I get in trouble with my parents? And because we don't know, it becomes a conflict situation. And finally, we have a double approach avoidance conflict situation. And that's when uh, we have two potential outcomes. And in both of them, we don't know whether or not the situation will be good or bad. Uh, should I stay at home and, uh, and talk to my significant other on FaceTime or... Uh, because, you know, that will be good for my relationship, but also may damage the relationship with my friends. Or should I go to that party and have a better time with my friends, but at the same time, maybe upset my significant other? Ultimately, when we experience stress, we have to determine first, uh, we have to have a primary appraisal. Primary appraisal is essentially, do I feel stressed or not? If you do, then you go through a secondary or sometimes referred to as a cognitive appraisal. And the secondary or cognitive appraisal is what will I do about it? How will I respond to this stress? A lot of stressors come from our environment. Catastrophes are significant changes, uh, significant changes to your life because something that's bad has happened. So for example, the pandemic has significantly changed many people's life. And we would consider this a catastrophe and it's caused high amounts of stress for a lot of people because it's really hard to deal with that kind of drastic change so quickly. Significant life changes like getting married, having a child, buying a house can also be uh, fairly stressful even though they're seen as positive things. Uh, the amount of work, the amount of time, the amount of effort that you have to spend on some of these things uh, can create uh, significant amounts of stress. However, lots of us experience stress and don't really, uh, and, and aren't having lots of significant life changes, or maybe we're not in the pandemic or some sort of catastrophe. And that's when we experience hassles. Hassles are those little things, not doing as well as you might think of on a test, um, being worried uh, that 
you're going to do poorly on a test or poorly in some sort of competition. Uh, getting cut off on the freeway are all examples of hassles, those little things that build up and cause us to feel and experience more stress. But there's a way to counteract those feelings of hassles, and they're called uplifts. And uplifts are when someone does the little things that are really good for you. When, you know, someone writes you a note and tells you, like, how great a person you are. When someone brings you Starbucks to school, uh, even though you didn't ask for it. These are those little things that actually improve our emotional feelings and can counteract the significant effects of those built up hassles. When we talk about a reaction to stress, we, we experience a strong reaction to stress because when we do, we are going into our fight or flight mode. And there are three significant hormones that affect us uh, when we're in this mode. Epinephrine is the hormone that uh, puts us into fight or flight mode. So as we begin to experience the stress, then epinephrine kicks in. Norepinephrine helps maintain our body uh, and helps bring us out of stress. And cortisol regulates everything when we're in stress and out of stress. When we're in high levels of stress in that fight or flight mode, our cortisol levels are going to be high. And that helps maintain things like, uh, uh, like uh, high blood pressure, um, high breath rate. Um, it may divert sugars to our blood. Um, and then certainly once we go back down to calm, it's going to flip the switch and turn on some of those systems that shut off during fight or flight mode. Cortisol is the primary hormone that is great, but at the same time, when we have too much cortisol from chronic stress, from stress that just continues and doesn't stop, it can actually play a lot of havoc with our body and send us into things like anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, uh, as well as uh, damage to the body itself. When we go through stress, we experience what we call the general adaptation syndrome. This was coined by a guy named Hans Elise. And in that, we go through three distinct phases. The first phase is the alarm phase. This is when we react to the stress. This is when all of a sudden it kind of hits us and we have to respond. Then we have to deal with the stress. Sometimes this lasts five minutes. Sometimes it lasts two hours. Sometimes it lasts a couple of days. But that resistance mode is when our body is basically, and our minds are basically dealing with the effects of that stressor. Finally, once our stress is concluded, we go into exhaustion. If you've ever been really stressed out and then finally, once that situation is over, you just feel super tired, this is the reason why. You go through into that exhaustion phase. And, you, and the problem for people with chronic stress is that they never get to that exhaustion phase, uh, or if they do, it goes very, sh very shortly before they go back to the alarm phase. So how do people react to stress? Well, some people socially withdraw. They isolate themselves. Uh, they may crawl into their bed and go to sleep. And sometimes this can be good because sometimes this allows us to just escape the situation that's causing us so much stress. But at the same time, Doing this too much or doing it for a long period of time isolates ourselves and can lead to other kind of significant instances like depression. Some people respond with unhealthy behavior. Stress eating, for example, uh, will uh, because to combat the cortisol levels, we may eat so that our dopamine levels go up. Uh, some people will turn to substance abuse, alcohol or drugs. Uh, so that they can uh, basically experience uh, an altered state of reality uh, while and in that temporary altered state, the stress doesn't seem so significant. Obviously, the problem with substance abuse, especially alcohol and drugs, uh, is that um, it becomes uh, a form of classical conditioning uh, or even just operant conditioning where we choose to do that each time, but then with the, when the classical conditioning kicks in, we don't feel right unless we've had that substance. And that's and that's the only way we can eliminate the stress. And that, of course, is uh, one of those hallmark signs of developing an addiction. Uh, some people will turn to healthy behavior. 
exercise, meditation, yoga, etc. And these kind of things can be really, really beneficial uh, in the way that we deal with stress because it calms us down. And when we're in a state of calm and not in a state of panic, then we can uh, look at things a little bit more rationally. Some people look at stress and treat it as a challenge. They can say meet, meeting the challenge. They, those people, when they look at that stress, they don't look at it as something negative. They look at it as something that is going to allow them to grow and get better as, an, as a result. Some people, especially women, uh, use a technique called tend and befriend. Uh, tend and befriend allows you to help your own stress stress reactions by helping somebody else's stress reactions. When you tend to somebody else, you form an, a, a significant emotional bond, and then that emotional bond will help in turn help you in your own uh, reaction to stress. Stress has a significant effect on our overall physical health. For one. Stress literally can cause us to age faster. Our DNA is capped by a, a, something called telomeres. These telomeres decay as we age. And when the telomere has decayed completely, uh, the cell uh, that that DNA is from uh, will die. What stress will do is essentially artificially shorten these telomeres. And so while we, you know, in a normal state, our telomeres will decay at a normal rate. When we're under a significant amount of stress, the telomeres actually decay faster. A lot of times stress can cause psychophysiological illness, um, which essentially is when we get physical reactions to that stressed out mental state. Uh, in some cases, it might be headaches. In other cases, it might be high blood pressure. Sometimes we might get uh, strained sensations in our skin, uh, like in the form of tingling or pain. Ultimately, this has led to a whole subfield of uh, psychology and neurology uh, called psychoneuroimmunology, which essentially looks at uh, our thoughts and how our thoughts influence uh, the way that our brain works, which in turn influences our immune system and over our overall physical health. When we talk about our physical health, we need to talk about the immune system. The immune system is the primary system that helps us heal our body. The primary helpers or the primary support that we have in our immune system are lymphocytes. And there's a number of different types of lymphocytes, and some of them have really fun names like hunter killer lymphocytes uh, or natural killer lymphocytes. Uh, and these lymphocytes seek out infection and they seek out uh, whether it's viral infection or bacterial infection or inflammation uh, from, uh, say, a broken bone or a cut. Uh, and the lymphocytes are what essentially repairs us um, and repairs the infections that we have. Whenever we experience a broken bone, a viral infection, bacterial infection, our body experiences inflammation. Stress will cause inflammation within our blood vessels and the lymphocytes go to attack it. Additionally, when we are very stressed out, we not only have our lymphocytes attacking the inflammation in our blood vessels rather than our infections and our, uh, and our injuries, but it will also suppress the immune system. So it will cause the immune system to temporarily essentially shut down. And then when it starts back up, the lymphocytes are attacking the inflammation of the blood vessels due to stress and not the, uh, the illness uh, or the infection uh, or, the, uh, or the injury. So ultimately we see that with the immune system, uh, not only does stress shut it down, but it also diverts those helpful things that we have within our immune system that will help uh, heal us faster. And so what we see is that people who are chronically stressed um, will uh, be sick for longer. It will take them longer to recover from injury. Uh, and they're more likely uh, to get um, minor different infections that we may not notice uh, because our body fights it off so quickly. One of the main issues with stress is heart disease. Heart disease is the number one killer of people in this country. 
and stress is a primary contributor to it. One reason why this happens is that when we go into fight or flight mode, our internal, some of our internal organs shut down so that our body can survive in the moment. One of these organs that shuts down temporarily is the liver. The liver is the main organ that filters out toxins uh, within our bloodstream. And a lot of times, if we're experiencing chronic stress and our liver is shutting down, then the fat and cholesterol toxins uh, don't get filtered out by the liver and instead flow in our blood and collect in the arteries, especially around our heart. This, of course, can lead to higher levels of heart disease. But it's not the only way that this all happens. The reason why this happens, especially to people who experience chronic stress, is because their body never goes into an exhaustion mode. that never gives their body a chance to recover. And when that happens, uh, you get more and more fat and cholesterol collecting around the arteries. For people who have type A personalities, which are a little bit more high strung, a little bit more uh, goal oriented, uh, and, um, and definitely kind of more organized and more uh, and, and more conscious about time and things like that, they may get a lot of things done, be, but because they're experiencing high levels of stress all the time, because they're always trying to get the next thing done, they rarely let their body get into, uh, into some, any sort of uh, just relaxation mode. And then that, of course, keeps that fight or flight mode going, which can lead to higher levels of fat and cholesterol. People who are type B, which are a little bit more chilled out, a little bit more easygoing, they also can experience stress. And sometimes they may experience more intense stress because they're not used to it the way that people who are type A are. But at the same time, uh, they also give their bodies a chance to go through a, that exhaustion phase and recover from that stressful incidence. Finally, Things like anger, pessimism, and depression can all contribute to heart disease and raise our stress levels. When people experience anger and rage at tiny little things constantly, their body is constantly going into this fight or flight mode, just like people who are, you know, maybe potentially type A. They're experiencing chronic stress over and over again. Pessimism has a similar result. Uh, pessimism uh, can increase the amount of stress we're experiencing because as we look at the, our life situation with a negative mindset, uh, we are going to mentally create stress in our head. And then that, of course, causes the inflammation of the blood vessels along with uh, the shutting down of the liver and then higher levels of fat and cholesterol. In fact, people who are pessimistic, um, even after adjusting for risk factors like smoking, pessimists were twice as likely as optimists uh, to develop some sort of heart disease. Finally, uh, depression can also play a role. Uh, when we look at uh, depressed moods, uh, those who are in a depressed mood are going to be much higher and much more likely to develop things like a heart attack. And this, of course, is because high levels of stress can contribute to the onset of depression. And then when we are depressed, we are going to experience stress more. And so it kind of works in a very vicious cycle uh, where ultimately we're depressed more. So we'll carry out some unhealthy behaviors. We'll have an unhealthy mindset that will the unhealthy behaviors will contribute more to heart disease uh, and the depression will contribute more to our stress levels. And ultimately, uh, this will cause higher levels of higher blood pressure, inflammation, suppression of our immune system and the potential for heart disease. Now, I know that's kind of pessimistic to think about, um, but the reason why I think this is so important is because when we look at heart disease, which is this huge killer of people in this country, so much of it is tied to our mindset. And sure, unhealthy behaviors and things like that play a role too. But at the same time, if we're able to control our mindset, even if our behaviors are unhealthy, we're already reducing our risk factor. And that is the end of the lecture.